Hello. Today I'm going to read out the 28th chapter of my book, Philosophizer's Bible, and the chapter's called Rubber Bands. Um, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but first I wanted to thank the person who asked a question um, on the previous video, and it was about knowledge of ultimate reality. Why do I say that that's impossible? Is it something to do with the nature of human thought? That's a plausible, that's a very plausible idea. And in fact, um, the metaphysician, the British metaphysician F.H. Bradley, in his great work, Appearance and Reality, made that very point. He said that human thought works using the conceptual apparatus of terms and relations. And that means we cut things up we categorize things, we put things together, but the nature of ultimate reality, which he called the absolute, is something that can only be comprehended as a whole. And its very nature precludes the possibility of grasping it through thought. So it is something about the nature of thought itself that makes knowledge of ultimate reality impossible. That's not my view. I've already given my argument, which is a bit of a weird argument, um, based on a pop song, and the pop song is Is That All There Is? by Jerry Lieber and Frank Stoller. Is that all there is? Whatever, whatever account of ultimate reality you gave, the response would be, is that it? Is that the whole thing? And what it points to is the fact that no account could be big enough or deep enough. And that's why I talk about pictures in the head, um, things that we make up, our human tendency to embrace beliefs, because nothing of that nature could be big enough to account for existence itself. Um, take that answer or you leave it. Um, I'm not going to say that answer is good enough for me. I, I'm not here to argue, really. I've come to the conclusion that the knowledge of ultimate reality is impossible, that's it. Now on to the next task, whatever that task may be. Right, so this chapter, getting on to this chapter, is about what happens when you get tired. And I was all, more than three quarters of the way through writing my book when I got to this chapter, and I really was getting tired. I mean, not just physical fatigue, but mental, you know, the, the mental weight of having gone this far and there's still a certain distance to go. And it occurred to me that this would be a good topic to actually discuss. And it's more than just a good topic, it's actually a very fundamental objection to my solution to the meaning of life problem. I said that all I wanted to, was to be motivated. As long as I'm motivated, I'm happy. As long as I'm motivated, I will just carry on, whatever it is, whether it's taking photographs or writing a philosophy book or whatever. But what happens when the motivation goes? You don't have any beliefs. There's no ultimate reason why you should do anything rather than nothing. You know, there's nothing that you can appeal to no rational principles that say you should do this rather than that. You can do what you like. And in the chapter I talk about going out on a long walk. And what, you know, you get so tired, you wonder, well, should I get a taxi home? What else should I do? And one possibility is, okay, you've got to get home. But do you have to get home? You don't have to get home. You could change your identity. You could have a new life. You don't have to do anything. You make the decision to carry on. And as I say in the chapter, you just don't think about it, you just carry on. And that's not an answer to the objection, it's just a description of what happens, what actually happens. You know, I'm not always motivated, I'm not always strongly motivated. But I can predict that my motivation will increase at certain times. I know that if I get my typewriter out, I'm more likely to be motivated to write. So that's the first step. And there's all sorts of ways you can trick yourself and push yourself into a direction that you know will make you 
um, happier or more productive or whatever. And that's that's really all. Except for yeah, the, the point about you can do anything. Sartre makes this point and calls it the vertigo of possibility. The young wife who imagines that she could be a prostitute and then is scared sick because it's a choice she could actually make. Or the person who stands at the top of a building and suddenly gets gripped by the fear that they could choose to jump off. Uh, that's been, that's a, a thing that's been discussed. It's an actual, um, it's something that people actually feel. It's part of, when people talk about having vertigo, that's one of the things that they fear. Not just they might trip, but they may actually decide to jump. So, you know, if I was, you know, if this was really sort of a sort of classic existentialist discussion, I'd be going into, you know, the whys and wherefores of that. But I'm not really interested in that. I'm not phased by the thought that I could decide to do anything because that isn't where I'm at. I am motivated. I'm motivated to make these videos. I'm motivated to write and so on. And in the gaps when I'm not motivated, I have sufficient presence of mind to keep going because I know the motivation will return. That's basically it. So anyway, let's get on with the chapter. See if there's anything interesting there to discuss. There's a time when you are on a long walk, when it begins to seriously hurt. Your muscles begin to pull like rubber bands. With each stride you can feel the twang. And let's say you are too far from transport, a bus stop or a train station. Maybe you could call a cab to come out to you in the middle of nowhere, if the driver can find you. Except that there's no way you're going to blow the money for your evening pint and takeaway on a cab. So you continue. Ignore the discomfort. Hum a tune or play your favourite rock album in your head. Notice the way the clouds move or just the sound of your own footsteps. The steady beat of time. Then you remember. Time beats on regardless. Whether you continue walking or stop and rest or find a bus stop or phone for a cab. So it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do. You might as well carry on. I've taken my best photographs on walks like this. When I was beyond tiredness, high on tiredness, when familiar surroundings, trees, houses, cars, roads, sun, sky, become unfamiliar, strange, even threatening. No clue where I am or how I got here. Somewhere across the river, the endless, ugly, sprawling expanse of South London. Street after street after street, more and more and more of the same exactly the same and people live here too people and dogs i've never seen so many dogs there were two dalmatians sprawled in the road keeping cool in the shade of a parked van after the third or fourth fourth shot of my pet with my pentax i could see the owner walking menacingly towards me i made a hasty retreat i actually found the photograph it's there you can see it um, there were three or four on the contact sheet. That was the best of them. It's on my Flickr feed. I don't belong in this world. A visitor from Mars. The man who fell to Earth. The Jew from North London. Ha ha. Then, finally, for the first time today, you see. The same becomes different. Things resolve. The fuzziness dissipates. The fog clears. There's a connection there between gathering images with my camera and putting words on paper with my typewriter that could be worth exploring. I can't quite see it yet. It might still come. Isn't it odd how these thoughts occur to me now? I shouldn't be tired. I got up, got up early this morning with enough, early enough to see the morning star shining like a searchlight in the pre-dawn sky, a rare enough event as I don't go to bed till well after midnight. And I've only been at my desk for an hour or so. The truth is, I can feel the burden, the weight of the chapters of this book already written, weighing down on me. I said I didn't know how this exercise would turn out. I've surprised myself a few times, some happy surprises. 
Yes, but now, now there's less than a quarter of the way to go. I have a pretty clear picture of how it ends. Not badly, at least. I don't think so. It just ends. I don't want it to end, but at the same time, I can hardly bear the thought of all the work there's still to do. Why can't it just be over with? Then I can get back to my normal state, bored, watching the clouds go by as my time slowly trickles out. Evening tiredness, that's something real enough. Second wind, third wind, fourth wind. You tell yourself as you pause from tapping the keys that you've written a decent amount today, except that you weren't out to write a decent amount. This morning you told yourself that you were going to write and write and not stop, remember? You grit your teeth. The pleasure is beginning to ebb away. In fact, it's gone, completely gone. What is this? Is this you believing in something? Who said you ought to continue? That's the thought. Who is this stern taskmaster? Your father, maybe. As I recounted in Philosophizer, I was always lazy in school. <laughs> the worst in the class by a long chalk. This is something else. Anger. Rage, even. Rebellion. A rebel's rage. Yes, I am rebelling against myself as much as anyone. Beating myself up for all the time I wasted, the time I allowed to slip by before I finally worked out, oh so late, what I am here to do. I've never done weight training, but I understand totally how you would put yourself through the pain and agony, not just for the sake of the perfect physique you have yet to achieve, a long distance still to go before you're even within hailing distance of Arnold, but because you can. That's all. I can. What is pain, anyway? Just a thought in the head. Its painfulness is up to me, isn't it? Nietzsche on self-overcoming and the overman. My perfectly defined six-pack proves that I'm a higher man than you'll ever be. Parenthetical remark. Women too, they can be ferocious bodybuilders, remembering now, quote, over the last few decades, female bodybuilding in particular has gone off into the stratosphere with women achieving physics, physiques once undreamt of when judged by the platonic idea of woman would be considered a grotesque parody of a human being. Yet surely here the achievement is just as great as those who attain to the heights of any sporting or athletic activity, unquote. That was in Ask a Philosopher, December 2000 to January 2001. What was I thinking? I don't know, don't ask me. I think I had a question that had involved Bruce Lee, something like that. Uh, and what was the, you know, what was the philosophy of sport and what philosophy got to do with sport? Oh yeah, speaking of Arnold, there's a memorable quote from the movie Terminator 2. John Connor asks the Terminator, doesn't it hurt when you get shot? T-800 replies in a flat voice, I sense injuries, the data could be called pain. That is so perfect. The Terminator, I like that. Thinkers have been banging on for decades about the end of philosophy. Heidegger, that Nazi fuck. Well, guess what? It's here, a second coming. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with a lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, W.B. Yeats. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter whether I stop or whether I continue. No one forced me to write this book. There are enough people who probably wish I hadn't started, ho ho. But if it really doesn't matter, then I might as well just carry on typing. Bear the pain. Make it into a positive. When this is over, then it's over then I can have fun. Be bored all day long if I like. Right now, I need to get back home. Ah. Oh. Yes, um, well that, that's not an adequate answer, as I, as I said before, you know. I don't have to get back home. Nobody has to get back home. You know, you can stay out, have a new identity. You have to make, you know, you make the decision. But there is something which is momentum, inertia. Once you keep going, you're motivated, it gets you going, 
And then the times when the motivation goes away, that momentum carries you along. And the key thing, which I haven't said yet, is faith. And I don't mean religious faith. I mean the trust that the momentum will carry you along. You don't always know the reason for what you do. You can't always explain you know, what, what is worth doing about this particular activity, whatever it may be. But you trust that we'll be able to carry on. Faith and trust. That's very strange, you know, to be hearing this from someone that, you know, who is not religious or doesn't have any religious beliefs as such. But they are absolutely crucial components in any account of what it is to live a meaningful life. Um, yeah, I don't have much to say. Let's just have a look at the next chapter. Um, Vengeful Ghosts. So I'm going to return in the next chapter to um, the two teachers, my two teachers, philosophy teachers from Birkbeck who killed themselves and a couple of other vengeful ghosts. Um, and after that we'll see. Thanks for watching. Bye.